never late is better Praying all the time, wishing time would fly by Felt like it was taking all day Can't deny it was worth the wait Better late than never, never late is better Praying all the time, wishing time would fly by Felt like it was taking all day Can't deny it was worth the wait What's up y'all, I'm Jim Drake Westbrook Worth the Weight Guy, a.k.a. the 30-year-old virgin. And today marks the fourth episode for the Worth the Weight Guy podcast. Today's special guest is Marcus Dupree, one of my best friends from Saginaw, Michigan, since the fourth grade. Marcus lives in Los Angeles, California, as owner and founder of G.W. Morley Films. He's an actor, he's a producer, he's a writer, and a director. I sat down with Marcus via Skype as we talked about life, business, entrepreneurship, sports, and music. Let's take a look. Ladies and gentlemen, Marcus Dupree, thank you for coming, man. Thank you for ha thank you for being on the show today, then, man. Hey, thanks for having me, uh, Jim Dre, man. I'm gonna be honest with you. I have to say this before we start, man. Like I, I appreciate you, brother, what you're doing out here. You uh, inspire uh, young men and young women like myself uh, to, you know, live at your own pace, live on your own path, man, and just be comfortable who you are. So, man, I, I appreciate you, man, for everything you've done. Oh, no, I appreciate that, Mark, uh, yes. especially coming from you. Uh, like I said, man, we've been, you know, riding together, and you've been my guy uh, for, for over 20 years, you know. Yeah, it's been a long time, man. It's, it's, it's been a while, so you uh, just giving me a little love, man. I really, really appreciate that, and uh, we'll segue that into uh, why we have you here today, man. I just want to ask a couple questions uh, okay. for the viewers. I'm pretty sure that they're very excited to hear uh, from another entrepreneur, uh, from someone that uh, may be in their shoes when it comes to making life decisions and trying to figure everything out, man. So uh, right. we'll, we'll get a little deep, but yeah. we'll also, uh, towards the end of it, man, uh, talk a little sports, talk a little music. Okay. And I uh, just want to kind of get uh, lighten the mood and get your opinion on a couple things. Cool? All right. All right. Cool, man. All right, man. So let's just jump right into it. In terms of um, you being you know, in Hollywood and you having a career in the film and entertainment industry, like I said, you're a writer, you're an actor, you're a director and a producer. So my question to you is out of all of those four, what comes the easiest to you? What could you do just waking up and probably get a role or probably write that dramatic scene? Uh, what comes the easiest? And then the follow up question would be, What's the most challenging? What what out of those four you actually need to sit down and you need to study and you know become one with that so you can accomplish your that goal? Yeah, I mean, honest with you, man. It, each position has its own element, and uh, it's different steps and procedures to for each position to make a film come to life, man. Right. But I would say for me. I would say the easiest is uh, acting. Okay. And the reason why I say that is because as an actor, you pretty much have the foundation of what you're doing. You have the groundwork of the writer, you have the groundwork of the director, and they give you this character. And all you really have to do is absorb that character and become one with it. Gotcha. And, and be willing to lose yourself and become that character but not that's not easy at all it's very challenging right, right. uh but it, it feels like it's it's you know the work has been done for you you just have to trust the writer with you know with their words and their dialogue you have to trust the director with their direction and uh and the producer with their filmmaking and, and making this all a, a reality and it's just you pretty much got to go in there and and uh, be one with this character and bring it to life. Got you, got you. But okay. I would say the most challenging, though, is writing. Yeah. Because uh, as a writer, you have to be extremely disciplined. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, from my last project, uh, as feature film, wrote Black in Season, uh, I literally was on a set schedule every single day. You know, I wake up at seven o'clock in the morning. I go to the gym to nine, and 
you know, uh, after that, I go straight to the local library and I will write from 930 to six every single day. And when the library closed, I will actually go to a next door coffee shop and be there from seven to 12. So I'm sitting in front of my computer writing this world that I'm, I'm creating for 12, 13, 14 hours a day. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's challenging is because you're not dealing, as an actor, you're dealing with one character. As a writer, you're dealing with multiple. Yeah. So you pretty much have to find that voice for every single person. You pretty much have to find that purpose mm -hmm. for each character. They're, they're, each one has, has their own objective. And, uh, and pretty much you have to bring all these characters together to make this whole film work. And that's the most challenging thing because... My, me, as a writer, I always have, you know, the voices of every character in my head. And, mm -hmm. and it doesn't stop until I actually have it all on paper. And right. have dealing with different personalities and you being this, this, this creator of this world, it can be very challenging. Because the thing is, uh, me, I don't uh, necessarily, I don't pull my stories from personal situations. Mm -hmm. I don't pull my stories from uh, or any of my friends or family personal situations because I do feel like that's dangerous. Yeah, it's a lot of writers out there who feel like you should write what you know, but I, I tend to stir away from that. Mm -hmm. I'm a person where I like to tap in in my into my imagination gotcha. and create something that I'm not comfortable with, that I'm afraid of, that I don't know anything about because mm -hmm. it helps me to bring the best work out. Yeah, yeah. Um and I can see why you do that. Like you said, a lot of people who write, uh, such as myself, uh, yeah. I'm a writer, but I'm writing about the story that I know, which is being a 31-year-old virgin, being worth right. the weight guy. So, yes, that is easier for me because I'm living it. You know, this yeah. is my mm -hmm. world. I'm telling everybody my story of, you know, why I'm waiting uh, for my future wife and, you know, my relationship with God. So right, yeah. that does come easy. But me writing about something that I don't know and, mm -hmm. you know, going into foreign territory would probably be a little intimidating, uncomfortable, yeah. you know, scary, if you will. Yeah. So, uh, no, I commend you for challenging yourself. You know, yeah. you're not trying to be the average writer or the normal writer who, like you said, we all could probably write about our family members, you know what I mean? Yeah. And mm -hmm. you know, rather it's comedy, love, or tragedy, you know, those things are real. So you can write about them. But yeah. you tapping into your imagination, like you said, uh, seems that it you might get your best work because you're actually pushing yourself, challenging yourself to be better than the norm. So uh, I, I like the fact that you're doing that. And, you know, I can attest a lot of the things that you've done that – even I've had small parts in, 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 in your works. I think they have brought the best out of you. Man, I appreciate that, man. I oh, do. Yeah. I really appreciate that. Oh, yeah. Okay, so um, you grew up, man. Like I said, you know, we're both from the same place. Uh, oh, yeah. Sag Nasty. Sag Nasty. And, um, <laughs> you know, you grew up wanting to be a chemical engineer. And yeah. um, that was something you always talked about, I remember – you know, growing up, going to school that, yo, you wanted to be a chemical engineer. Yeah. So yeah. in college, you started as a chemical uh, engineer major. Mm -hmm. and, but you had a change of heart. I did. Mean, so <laughs> <laughs> with that change of heart, man, I wanted you to talk to the viewers about were there any chain of events that happened to you personally where you decided to go from chemical engineering to theater? Like, could mm -hmm. you go back, which is almost 10 years ago? Well, actually, Man, come and, and, on, and, bro. You got to see it. <laughs> well, actually, when you think about it, the change happened more than 10 years ago. Yeah, uh, yeah, it did, so yeah. So if you could go back in, uh, into the mind of that freshman, sophomore, you know, Marcus Dupree, what made you change your major from chemical engineering to theater? And then looking back, do you think that was a good or bad decision on your part? Yeah, man, you're right. I um, went into, uh, you know, the University of Michigan, uh, chemical engineer major. And I remember my senior year, I did a uh, senior uh, project, like a monologue that I've written. And uh, one of my 
great people, like our mentors, both and our Mrs. Curry, she said, she pulled me to the side. She said, listen, I understand you want to be a chemical engineer, but one way you need to work on theater, you should think about it, at least a minor or something. And it was always in the back of my mind, that's what I always wanted to do. But during that time, you know, um, I think I was living for my family. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what I felt would my family be proud of, even though at that time I did, I loved the, you know, chemical engineering. I thought that was something I wanted to do. Eventually, it just wasn't for me. Right. And uh, I remember, I think it was my sophomore year, and uh, I had that, that one semester, I, I was, uh, it was rough. I had engin uh, engineering 101, chemical engineering 101, I had calculus 2, I had physics, I had chemistry, and, and, and some other class just to offset it. And it probably had to have been the most stressful time of my life. <laughs> you know, uh, and, and it just wasn't going too well for me uh, at all. And I remember, and I'm just going to keep it all the way real. Yep. Yes, um, I remember during that time, you know, I was drinking. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I remember in the dorm room, and I was sitting in front of my computer, and I had to uh, uh, make some type of coding for a video game for an engineer 101 class. And I was like, this is not something I want to do. And I was getting being stressed out. My, my grades were slipping. And I end up being on academic probation. And, and because of that, you know, uh, I became very stressful. Mm -hmm. And, you know, being that young and, and, and you know, the, the social person butterfly that I was, um, I was, I was drinking a little bit too much that night. And it was very dramatic. I remember, you know, I went outside. I had the bottle in my hand and everything. And I was literally crying. And praying at the same time. I know a lot of people will say, like, who does that? Who <laughs> cry and pray at the same time? Because the thing is, I was a, I, I just couldn't go back and tell my parents that I was on academic probation and, right. and, and losing my scholarship. Right. And because uh, I was, I had a scholarship with, through Dow Chemical during that time. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, we was on North Campus, and I walked to this little pond area, and, and I was sitting there, still crying. Uh, praying out loud, still kind of drinking, and I remember I threw the bottle in the palm. <laughs> this may have to be the most dramatic time of my life. So, and it, as I was throwing it, I was like, you know, what's my purpose? Right. Like, what am I supposed to do? Right, right. And I remember I turned around and walked to the door, and there was a deer staring right at my face. And he was just looking at me like I was crazy. And I stood there, and I was staring at the deer. And at, as the deer walked away and I went back to the room and I laid down and I was, you know, contemplating about my life and what I wanted to do next, still praying. Mm -hmm. To me, you know, a lot of people feel that God comes in different shapes and yep. forms. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, I felt like that was God mm -hmm. listening to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, even though my condition, mm -hmm. he still was listening to me. And uh, I prayed and I, I fell asleep. And when I when I fell asleep, when I woke up that next morning, theater was my uh, the first thing on my mind. And I remember I jumped out of bed, I put on my clothes, I went down to the consular office to see Charlay, and I told her, I said, "Listen, theater is the way I want to go." And she said, "Marcus, that's a huge jump." I said, "I know, but this has been on my heart, it's been on my mind for years, and this is something I want to do." And that's when I changed my major from chemical engineering to theater. And that's when I lost my scholarship, and my parents weren't too happy at all about the change. <laughs> right, right? Yeah, uh, I can imagine. Uh, yeah, I know yeah. my folks. Uh, you know, Jimmy Dale and, uh, and 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 Bev. They 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 wouldn't have been too happy either. Right, uh, right. <laughs> if, uh, I lost the scholarship that I had going to yeah. uh, University of Michigan. But I, mm -hmm. I want to two a couple of things. Uh, number one. I know that story uh, yeah, and yeah. that testimony that you just uh, you gave our know. viewers because we were roommates. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Uh, like I said, I, I've known Marcus uh, since the fourth grade, same yeah. school in same church. Uh, yeah. And like I said, we've lived together our entire uh, careers at U of M. So uh, I remember that story. Uh, yeah. And just a side note, he was drinking apple juice. If you guys are, you know, wondering what he was drinking yeah. with was the bottle, you know, that's, 
You know, yeah. that, that, that was some apple juice. But uh, apple juice. Simply May apple juice. Yeah, yeah. But, but uh, <laughs> other than that, like, I really like the story, Mark, not just because I was there, but yeah, it's yeah. true. You know, yeah. I really like the fact that you said, you know, God does come in different shapes, different sizes, different forms. And, yeah. you know, the, the thing about it is, is that he answers. He answered your call. You know, you were in a vulnerable position where you needed him. You didn't need anything else. You weren't finding any answers any other way. But you right. felt that God was the way to help you, to, to yeah, find bro. that purpose. And like yeah. you said, even if it comes in a form as a deer, it was him speaking to you only for you so you could get that message. Exactly. And, you exactly. know, if I could even answer the second question that I asked, was it a good or bad decision? I think it was a great decision. Yeah. Because uh, like you said, up. you went to Charlay. Shout out to Big Chuck, baby. Yeah. Uh, but you went to her the next day, and I think you really found your calling. You really found your passion. And I mm -hmm. think we all, you know, uh, oh, God, you know, uh, some thanks for that because you really, I think, found exactly what you want to do in life. Exactly, man. Yeah, my mom actually asked me a, a couple of days ago. Yeah, I regret making that change before this interview. It's crazy. It's uh, and I was like, listen, sure, I could have been living an all American dream life. You know, I could have been probably, you know, as a chemical engineer, making almost two hundred thousand dollars a year. Probably have a nice home and three or four cars and four or five kids at the age of thirty one. Yeah, I said, yeah, but I said, but that's you know, I would have been miserable. I said, I'm happy now. I'm happy for the struggle. I'm happy for my progress. Mm -hmm. I'm happy where I am right now because I know I'm that much closer to living my dream. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. Uh, wholeheartedly. Same here with my uh, journey, with my struggle and chasing my dream. So, uh, yeah, couldn't yeah. agree with you more on that one. Yeah. Uh, so we talked about, you know, our history at Michigan, uh, but I want to talk more about your individual history on you when you were a student actor i think yeah. uh it's wise for us to tell the audience that you know you made you made some history man you made some moves while you were an undergraduate student uh in the theater department at u of m uh, i want to talk about uh your first film uh unsound mind class. and also uh yeah it was a classic <laughs> and then also uh the history behind your stage name marcus dupree okay uh, yeah, Unsigned Mind, my first short film uh, that I uh, co-wrote and directed and produced alongside uh, our great friend David Tinsley. Mm -hmm. yes, and um, uh, during that time, um, I was doing extremely well in school. My uh, GPA was up. I was over to like a 3.3 grade point average. You know, I was focused. And uh, uh, my last semester, I, I took all the courses that I needed to graduate. And I... But I wanted to be a full-time student, so uh, my mentor, um, the late uh, Professor Glenda Dickerson, one of the best directors I ever worked with, taught me everything I know. And uh, Professor Oyamo, they were saying, hey, listen, you have six credits. What is it that you want to do to, you know, you, you have all your courses. What do you want to do so you get these six credits? So I said, well, I would like to be a student teacher. So they said, okay, you be a student teacher. You know, you will teach the freshman courses, what I, I enjoyed and loved. And he said, well, we give you three credits for that. You have three more credits. What is you want to do? And I said, well, uh, I would like to shoot a, a film. And they said, okay. I said, well, you know, they said, well, this is the thing. You shoot a film at the end of the year, we grade it, you get your three credits, you graduate. He said, okay, cool. So I teamed up with David, uh, and who was also an inspiring actor out here. Uh, and filmmaker, and we teamed up, and we, we, we put our minds together, and we wrote the story, Unsound Mind, and, uh, and uh, it was a great experience. We shot it in like six weekends, whatever, very low money, we fed everybody pizza every day, uh, and uh, we had a great cast, and we actually premiered it at the Michigan Theater, which is huge, because this theater that probably holds almost 2,000 people. And I remember going in, I met, I actually met the owner of the, uh, of the Michigan Theater in L.A. my very first time. And he told me, he said, listen, you do a movie, I'll let you premiere for nothing. So I did that. I contacted him. I said, I have this movie. He, he, he kept his promise. And, and he was like, hey, listen, I'm just going to give you the theater of maybe 50 seats. Because a lot of people are probably not going to come and see it. 
I said, you know, uh, I said, well, whatever theater you give me, I, I greatly appreciate it. He looked at the schedule and said, man, well, that, that theater's booked, so I have to give you the big one. We just rope it off so it won't look as bad. I was like, well, okay, all right, you know, uh, thank you for giving me the big one, which hold almost, two, you know, I'll say 15, 16, uh, hundred seats, but the, the bottom level uh, holds a thousand. And I remember that night when we pulled up and the, the line was around the corner. Yeah. It was, you know, students, it was people coming from Detroit, people were coming from uh, uh, from the other schools, man. It was, you know, family from Saginaw, friends from Saginaw was coming in. And all of a sudden, we sitting there like that whole first level was completely packed. Mm-hmm. And I remember the owner said, listen, we want to prepare for this. I only hired two workers for this night, thinking like you was going to have maybe 50, 60 people. He said, you, you really have like almost 900 people in this theater. This is probably the most ever from any student film that I ever premiered here. And he said, I'm, beyond, I'm impressed, and, I, and I, we wasn't ready for this. And he's like, I'm sorry, but because of lack of staff, a lot of people, because we charged, I think it was like 2 or $3 to see it. More than half of the people snuck in. <laughs> people didn't pay at all. And it was fine. It's cool. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was all right. But it was, it was just a great experience to have your colleagues and your peers to appreciate your work. Mm-hmm. And, and, and applaud the way that they did, man, it was probably one of the greatest feelings I had. Yeah. Um, but for my name, Marcus Dupree, I think uh, Dre remember this. I, I did a uh, one night of monologues featuring Marcus Dupree when I decided to drop my last name, Jones, because uh, I felt like Marcus Dupree just fit for the role I was going after, for the career I was going after. And, uh, you know, Dre, yeah, thanks again, man. You was the host that night, too. And uh, I actually performed five monologues uh, from different playwrights and uh, different plays. And, um, and I performed these five monologues. And at the end of that, that's when I announced that, you know, everybody knew it, Marcus Dupree Jones. But at the end of the night, that's when I said I'm going to go with Marcus Dupree. It was a great night that night as well. Oh, yeah. No, uh, both of those, uh, I think, were legendary moments in uh, yeah. our undergraduate career, especially for you. Uh, just seeing you and Dave and the whole crew grind out on sign mine uh, was unbelievable. Uh, mm-hmm. Like I said, I, I had a little cameo in there as I think I might have been like a little stunt double yeah. uh, <laughs> on, on one of the scenes, uh, which you know yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I, I embraced that role. Uh, yeah. it, it was it was good, man, to really mm-hmm. see you guys uh, just get it done. And like you yeah. said, to have the majority of our peers come support it. Like, it, yeah. it, it was um, definitely a phenomenal thing to happen uh, at that time in our lives. And same with your name change. Uh, you know, I was very yeah. fortunate to host that night uh, for you. And just to get that support, you got a lot of love. You got a lot of people asking a lot of questions who were very interested in your career path at that time. And mm-hmm. um, that's, that, that just spoke volumes to your character, but just not your character who you really were as a person, man. Like, people really supported you, but then also believed in you. Like, they believed yeah, yeah. in Marcus Dupree. And that was, um, you know, I, that was a sight to see. And uh, it's pretty yeah, it cool to cool. continue to see you grind, you know, as Marcus Dupree. Yeah, man. I appreciate that, man. Oh, yeah, man. So uh, we'll move right along. We're about halfway um, through the whole interview. So uh, we'll, we'll bang these out. Uh, real quick, so uh, you know you can get on with your night uh, and, and do. Your <laughs> I, mean, I know I'm long winded, man. I just talk. <laughs> no, it's all good, man. We good. <laughs> but uh, the next one, man. Growing up, uh, yeah. back in the day, uh, even starting through elementary, you were a talented musician, and mm-hmm. also you were a talented bowler. A lot of people yeah. don't know that about you. Yeah. So my question to you is, if you weren't pursuing an acting career, a career in the arts, what career would have been more uh, entertaining or you would have enjoyed more, being a professional musician or being a professional bowler? Yeah, growing up, yeah, growing up, I loved both. Uh, I grew up playing drums. I grew up playing piano. uh, But bowling was my first love. It's uh, something I grew into, uh, grew into. My father, my whole family are bowlers. And uh, uh, I was actually ranked third in the state as a bowler in high school. Uh, I, averaging, I was averaging like 205. 
um, actually went very high into the tournament. I remember we had this game where me and this guy, and we, we were bowling against each other in the tournament, and we both had seven strikes in a row. And these people were around applauding and, and watching us doing this game and stuff like that. And I remember he went up there in this eighth frame, he threw another strike, and the pressure was on me, and I, I threw my ball down. I ended up with a 17 split. And I ended up losing, but, man, bowling, definitely. Bowling is my first love. Yeah, no, I, uh, I kind of figured you'd say bowling. I knew you yeah. played the piano and the drums. Yeah. Uh, but I figured that you, you probably would have more fun being a bowler. Oh, you yeah. Know, you know, getting your Pete Weber on, you know what I mean? Exactly. Uh, <laughs> you know, definitely. I wasn't a, a good bowler like that. Uh, but I think for me, in being a musician as well, when you know I played the sax when we were in the band together, I think I could have probably enjoyed a career, you know, on, 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 on the saxophone. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, could de I definitely could see, you know, you, you being that bowler, though. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, so the next question that I have, uh, you kind of talked about it a little bit when you uh, talked about your story uh, with your major or mentioned in a couple of names like Charlay and like uh, Mrs. Curry. Um, mm. A support system. How important is it to have a support system while you're chasing your dreams? Uh, and then just name a couple other people other than uh, the names we mentioned who were some of your biggest supporters that help you get to where you're at today. Yeah, uh, it's extremely important to have supporters while chasing your dream because you realize as you get older, when you're younger, you feel like you know it all. Mm -hmm. You know, you got everything figured out. But when you get older, you realize that uh, your family is your backbone. Your friends are your backbone. And you can't do it alone. And you're going to need help one day or another. And, you know, like my mother, my father, my, my brothers, my, my aunts and uncles. And, and after they realized how, how serious I was about pursuing acting, after they saw my work, that's when they were all in as well. What do you need? Uh, how can we help you? How can we support you? And especially in my friends, you know what I mean? Like, you know, you and all of our, our boys that we, that we grew up with that, you know, uh, talk to daily and we push each other and inspire each other to work hard and keep going because we all have uh, different career paths, but, you know, we all have that same come and go. And, you know, so it's like I want to be able to give back to my family because they took care of me for a very long time. So, you know, I want to be able to give back to them. So it's very important to have that, that strong support system when chasing your dream. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, family's everything. Oh, you know, yeah. Like you said, so, you know, when you're, you know, grinding, when you yeah. feel like you don't have anything else, you know, family will be there. Right. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I have the same testament, um, same story. You know, you guys have definitely been uh, motivating, you know, mm -hmm. within my career. Uh, my sister, who's my best friend. You know, my mom, my dad, my aunt, you know, uh, like I said, just having them there uh, yeah. means a lot. Uh, yeah. there's sometimes, like I said, that's all that you have other than, you know, your foundation, maybe your relationship with God. You don't have anything else. You know? Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's good to see that, you know, family is top of mind with you. Oh, yeah. Uh, definitely. They're, they're able to get you through those tough times. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we got uh, just a few other questions. Uh, they'll be quick hitters. I know this next question may be probably uh bring back a lot of childhood memories yeah uh but uh since we like, like i told everybody you know we've been boys since the fourth grade yeah. uh i'll give you i'll let you answer then i have a, a short answer but uh what's your favorite if you have any because i'm sure we have a lot fate one give me one favorite childhood memory uh of us together as friends well man i'll be honest with you yeah you're right we have so many especially going to the same elementary same middle school, same high school, and college together. Right. And too many best friends can say that. Right, right, right. And uh, so we pretty much watched each other grow as young boys to young men to men. Mm -hmm. uh, but my favorite, though, is the when you, uh, in fourth grade, man, when I, the day I had my favorite jeans on, Stone Watch jeans, man. <laughs> and I remember uh, you came in, and you was at the pencil shopping, man, and and uh, I actually intentionally broke my pencil to go up there to uh, sharpen my pencil, man, too, to introduce myself to you, man. You know, say, just, you know, say what's up, you know, everything good, man. Welcome to the family because our school is like a family. And, man, ever since then, that, that's probably my favorite memory because that's something I always think about, like, where it all began, man. 
Yeah, and it's uh, it's crazy because that's mine. Yeah, uh, you know, I didn't know which one you were gonna say, and uh, like I said, we never talked about this, so yeah, I, uh, I, I kind of assumed that you would say something else, but yeah, that's actually my favorite memory as well, because like you said, yeah. that's where it all started. That's where it started. Uh, yeah. I was the new kid in school, uh-huh. uh, and you know, I didn't know anybody. Right. So, uh, you know, you kind of when you're that new kid, nobody wants to talk to you. You know, they're pointing mm-hmm. at you, you know, me mugging you. So, yeah, yeah. you know, you really don't say anything. You know, you, you just kind of just stay to yourself. And right. I do remember, like you said, man, cat had the little, you know, tail going on and a little fresh <laughs> haircut, <laughs> stone wash jeans, the L.A. gears, you know, um, and, and, and was the same way you are today, man. Friendly social you know just wanting to make sure everybody having a good time thing yeah and uh i definitely agree i think that that was the beginning of the friendship where it was like you know what this cat is cool and then later on you know like man this cat is cool and this cat knows all the girls like like they they love them so it's like (laughs) we kind of became you know a nice you know tag team where you know you know we were also great students you know yeah we play yeah, yeah. sports together we were in the band you know like it became where it's like yo you see mark you see dre you see dre you see mark so yeah. uh no i i i agree man i, I think that that because yeah. it, it started there uh yeah. that probably was you know my, my favorite childhood memory too oh yeah man. oh yeah all right cool so yeah i got uh just four quick ones uh we can give short answers uh, but in oh, ten, no, no, we good, we good, we good. Uh, ten years later from now, so we're talking twenty, uh, twenty, uh, twenty-five actually. Who is Marcus Dupree? Who was the man? Who was the actor? And ten years from now, uh, Marcus Dupree will be a uh, great husband and an even better father. And, um, you know, uh, a family man, uh, um, to build his own legacy and stuff like that. And, and, you know, one, you know, have my four babies or whatever. I don't know how many it will be, but that's where I want to be, be a great family man. Uh, you know, uh, a great person, um, uh, my, my great friend, great brother, uh, great son, uncle, you know, best is my ability you know but as an actor uh in 10 years i want people to be able to look at me and say he's a true artist uh i want to be able to reach every person who supports my project and one way or another emotionally and i want you to be able to come to see my work and escape from your reality and tap into my imagination for 90 to 100 minutes and and people can walk out there and and feel I made some type of impact in their lives, uh, uh, help them to make a decision, you know, or help them to see something that they couldn't see before or something like that, or help them laugh or cry or get sad or mad. It's, that's, that's, a, uh, that's to me, that's very important of being a, a great artist. Okay, uh, great answer. You know, um, mm-hmm. I like that answer. And I think everybody uh, could appreciate your outlook on uh, life in the next 10 years. Yeah. Uh, another future question. Uh, you talked about wanting to be a father, wanting to be a, a husband. So this is kind of a marriage question. Uh, if you could pick only one person to sing at your wedding, who would it be? And I'm asking that as if your wife was willing to give you that. Uh-huh. Because I'm sure we all know, you know, that's her day. So. She yeah. would probably want one of her singers. But if she right. gave you, you know what? This is the one thing that you can have. I want you to pick three, one person out of your three, uh, some of your favorite singers. So I'm going to give you R. Kelly. Okay. I'm going to give you Keith Sweat. All right. Or your boy, Kevon Edmonds. Oh, come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> You only could pick one, man. I, I know you, I know, I know you like those the off-brand cats, man. Other than oh, Kale, that's the so. hardest question of the night. Yeah, you you only get one, man. And I was just listening to uh, Keith Sweat yesterday, <laughs> man. Come on, man. Oh, man, dude. Now, man, what if I I say Kayvon for the mayor, for the wedding? 
uh, uh, R. Kelly for the reception and, and, and Keith for the honeymoon. <laughs> you trying to bring Keith to the honeymoon? <laughs> I thought you was going to say Keith to the after party, but you, you trying to bring my man to the honeymoon, no? <laughs> hey, listen, Keith has some hitters, dog. <laughs> hey, but hey, if I had to pick one, I, I, I'd go with my boy uh, Robert Kelly, man. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah, that's the guy right there. Yeah, I mean, it, Kells is, for our generation, he's probably, when it comes to that, um, the goat, if you will. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so I definitely uh, respect that, and I see where you're going. Uh, if I had the choice, uh, I'd have to go with my boy Music Soul Child. Uh, uh, okay, know, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm a big Neo yeah. Soul guy, and and music. I mean, he's the best at what he does. Uh, so I definitely think uh, I would, um, if I could have a choice, I, I would definitely go with my boy, uh, my boy uh, Music, aka Zach. So uh, okay, cool, and. Uh, <laughs> I, I, got, I got you. I got you. So, last two questions, and then we're going to be out. Um, it's an LA versus Saginaw question. It's a food question. Okay. Uh, I want to get your quick take on Roscoe's chicken and waffles Ooh. or Vargas bread tacos. Oh, man. Come on now. I lit, oh, man. When I first moved to LA, I probably ate uh, Roscoe's probably two or three times a week, man. <laughs> Uh, but man, I'll be honest with you. I got the Vargas bread right now in the freezer, bro. Let's go. Let's go. I got to go with the Vargas bread tacos. There's nothing better than that. I'm trying to tell you. I had my little taco night. People out here don't know nothing about it, man. I got to go with the Vargas bread. They, they don't either. And, uh, every time as Mark knows, I go to LA, like you don't even ask me anymore when we go into Roscoe's, like you take me there and just just let me know when you want to go. Yeah. But. Yeah, Skulls ain't got nothing on Vargas Bread Tacos. Uh, We're bragging about it because we're from Saginaw, and that's where you get uh, the taco shells, Vargas Bread. Uh, People who are from Saginaw who might have, you know, stopped in Saginaw who know about Vargas Bread, Mm -hmm. you can ship it to your house. Like, you don't have to go back to Saginaw anymore just to get eat those tacos. Like, shipments are going crazy all the time. And people could, you know, have their taco nights, as Marcus talked about, and eat Vargas, Var, Vargas, excuse me, Vargas bread tacos. So no, I, I'm with you, man. It ain't, ain't nothing like, you know, the tacos from the SAG, man. No, not at all. Can't beat. Nah, I can't beat them. Uh, and speaking of Saginaw, if you want to get probably the best tacos in Saginaw, you got to go to the right spot. So I just kind of wanted to give a quick yeah. plug to yeah. Mr. and Mrs. Burns, the right spot, definitely the place. To go get the tacos. Yeah, yeah. We got no way. All right. So last question, and then we out, man. I couldn't uh, leave without doing a sports question and okay. talking about our boys. University of Michigan, Big Blue, Blue is doing their thing. We're 5-1. Oh, yeah. and one. We're number 12 in one poll, number uh, 14 in the other poll, and yeah. we got a big game. Big yeah. time game Probably. this weekend. Michigan Stadium actually – College game day is going to be at Michigan Stadium when we play our arch rival, Michigan yeah. State, a.k.a. Right. Little Brother, even though they've been big brother as of late. Uh, they won the last, I want to say, five out of six. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, they have, you know, they, 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 they got our number right now. But Harbaugh, our, our savior, he's come in. He's done some great things with that program in a very short amount of time, Mark. So I want to know who's who you got. Who, who's going to win? Are we going to get the Spartan Dogs this weekend? Man, listen, if we was 0-6, I wouldn't give little brother not anything. <laughs> <laughs> Man, this this ends this weekend. Man, uh, uh, Michigan Wolverines, we're going on top, man. Yeah, We're going on top. I think it's going to be a low-scoring game because they both have great defenses. But I, I, would, I would give – I would say – 17-14, Michigan. Okay. Yeah, uh, I agree. I agree that Michigan, yeah, we will beat uh, State. I yeah. think it will be a hard-fought game. Uh, mm-hmm. If people don't know our defense, we have pitched three consecutive shutouts. So, yeah. So uh, we're making history. Uh, ha- oh, yeah. It hasn't been done since 1980. Uh, last Michigan team that did it was uh, 1948, and we won a national championship. Mm-hmm. So uh, I really, really think that uh, – I think we're going to win. I see a close score around that, maybe a three-point three, three point score. Yeah. Maybe, I don't know, may, maybe we'll go 20, 21-17. 20, 
I, I got a similar score to, to your score. But, yeah, I think we beat the Spartans and then we'll be in the top ten. And yeah. I think we'll go ten and one before we play Ohio State. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We go 10 and 1 and be in that 14, too. Yeah, yeah. We'll be yeah, right we'll there. Be top four. We'll be yeah. right there. And that's, yeah. I mean, if we get there, I think it's safe to say Michigan football is back. It's back. Yeah. No matter what we plan, no matter how much it costs, I'm going to be there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel you. That'd be a nice birthday present for myself, too. I'd like to thank Marcus Dupree for sitting in on the Worth the Weight Guy podcast and allowing us time to reminisce about the good old days back in Saginaw, Michigan. We talked about sports, we talked about the arts, school, church, and family. i like to really thank Marcus on his journey for being honest and being open about what it has taken for him to achieve his dream in Los Angeles, California. If you want to watch this full episode, please tune in to WorthTheWeightGuy.com. Also, if you're not following us on our social media accounts, please tune in at WorthTheWeightGuy on all social media platforms. That's Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For the next Worth The Weight Guy podcast episode, I'll have another special guest that we will dig deep and find out what makes them go, what makes them get out of the bed and chase their dreams and live at their own pace every single day. Until next time, God bless, stay safe, and always. Stay fly, fly. I'm higher than most of most.